AI. It's everywhere, right? It's on every billboard that I passed coming here. Um, it's in every ad, <clears throat> and it's in every vision of the future. Um, you're either in it, you're trying to get into it, or you're worried about it, or maybe all three. Well, I got into AI a long time ago, when I was a college student. That was a long time ago. Um, because I'm really interested in the way the brain creates behavior in the world around us. And by that, I don't mean just words, but actual behavior. How do we move about? How do we relate to one another? And to study that, I got into robotics, because robotics is AI in the real world. And so I went on to grad school, to MIT, to the AI lab there, and I could spend quite a few years playing in the space of ideas about AI. And I was particularly interested in biological systems, because biological systems are the beginning of intelligence. So how, for example, does a rat navigate so well? And can we learn something from that and then make better robots? So I made my first robot, Toto, um, that navigated just like a rat, but didn't exactly look like one, but that's OK. Then I was also fascinated by things like flocks of birds that create these amazing 3D structures in the sky, and no one's in charge. How does that happen? And could we use that somehow to coordinate teams of robots? And I had a team of robots. I was very lucky, or not, depending on how you look at it. I had my nerd herd. It was like a bunch of little toaster-like robots, 20 of them. And uh, it was basically an entire PhD dissertation to get these 20 little toasters to navigate and herd and even learn from each other. They learned from one another. I learned a lot. Eventually, I finished my dissertation. I went off to be a professor so that I could play in this space of AI ideas with amazing graduate students and undergraduates. And I did that for a while, and it was wonderful and really satisfying. And then, boom, something completely amazing happened. Uh, we would call it a phase transition, um, like a, an epic moment in my life. And I think most of you can relate. I became a mom. Actually, three times, definitely my best work by far. Um, a lot of learning happening there. And it was an amazing thing, because suddenly, everything that I had been doing in my work um, no longer meant as much. Um, I was no longer interested enough to just play with ideas, because I had someone much cuter and much more interesting to play with. Um, but now, you know, what was I going to do? And this new interesting person pretty soon asked me, Mama, why do you make robots? Hmm, why? You know, I hadn't really thought about that for a long time, right? I got on a kind of a, on a rail, I you know, went to school, went to grad school, became a professor. Why? Why am I doing this? Um, and I, I could say to my sweetie, well, you know, AI and robotics in particular is intelligence in the real world. Nerdy. Or I could say, you know, our papers are really well published and well cited, and we get a lot of grant money. Boring. Kids don't care about stuff like that. And you know what? Kids are really smart. Kids have good, actually great values, because kids are always asking why. And we maybe forget to ask that. And so I thought about it. How can I impress my kid? How can I impress all the kids? Um, and I knew there was one really good answer. And that answer is, mama makes robots that help people. So suddenly, I knew what I needed to do. This was it. This was my purpose. I had to somehow bring AI and robotics together in a way that it could help people pretty soon, because, you know, kids are impatient and they grow up, and, you know, I'm going to grow up. And so, you know, it had to happen quickly. So suddenly, I had this mission, this purpose, um, and it seemed like it would be really hard. Like, what could I do? Turns out, it wasn't hard at all to figure out what to do. And the thing that I realized we should work on is bridging the care gap. So what is this care gap that I like to talk about? So the care gap is the gap between the needs of literally millions of people in the kinds of care that they need to receive and the care that is actually available to them. And examples are everywhere, everywhere you look. So this was the easy part. For example, um, one in six children in the U.S. has some kind of a developmental disorder. If you can diagnose that early and intervene even with the slightest of interventions, you can change the course of their entire life for the better. Autism. One in 45 children today is diagnosed with autism. The number is, has quadrupled over the last 20 years, and it continues to grow. Children with autism don't even have the luxury of playing with other children and learning social skills, because they often don't have peers who will play with them. 
And now, even though it's shortly after the COVID pandemic, the actual big pandemic that we have is anxiety and depression. And especially you see it in adolescence because it affects the adolescent brain in particular in strong ways, but it goes across the age span, adults and elderly. So we have this epic challenge. Also, as we get older, I'm sorry to say, stroke is on the rise. And if you've had a stroke and survived, um, you basically have to retrain your brain to relearn to do things that you learned when you were a little kid, like you know, walking and reaching for something. And to do that, it's, it's a slog. You have to basically do these boring exercises for hours and hours per day, and you have to keep failing. That's really hard. What's going to keep you motivated to do that? And then finally, as we really get older, um, unfortunately, people get more and more isolatedly lonely and depressed. Um, and they lose the, the will and the desire to keep going. So that is the care gap. So how can we help millions of people while keeping in mind that while we can use AI for this, in the end, we're profoundly human. And for us as humans, human care is the best care. So we have this in inherently human need to be with others like ourselves. So how do we create technology that can supplement human care and serve that very profound human need. So answering that question brought about this new field of socially assistive robotics. It's not so new now, it's about 21 years old, so it's a young adult, you know, getting out there. Um, and this is really exciting. So this, this field is based on the premise that these robots are physical robots, they're in the real world, you'll see, they're out among us. But at the same time, they're not doing any physical work. In fact, they're helping each of us do our own work through social support. So that's the idea of socially assistive robotics. So let me give you some examples. So in my lab, we started out, well, in a lot of different things, but we started out in particular in stroke rehab from the very beginning. Because remember, it's a slog to recover even the basic of functions. So we created these robots that would come up to a stroke patient and kind of encourage them and, well, let's see. Let's see what they did. How about we do a fun activity where I'm the robot and you're the librarian and you put the books away? Oh! <laughs> so she likes it. Sure. That's great. Immediately, though, she cheats. Look at that. She immediately tries to trick the robot. That's humans for you. Good job. No. How does he know? She keeps cheating again. Maybe it'll work this time. How does he know? How does he know? And also, why is it a he? <laughs> so we learned that people are really interesting, and you can't just create a transactional technologies and hope that people will like them. In fact, you have to make really engaging, interesting, personalized robots. And so one of the things that we did early was to create robots that actually had personalities. So we know that people get along better with people with similar personalities. So we thought, well, you know, if, if we created robots that are maybe really kind of assertive and more like coaches, that would really work with users that are more on the extroversion side of the spectrum of extroversion, introversion. And if we created kind of more supportive, you're doing great, it'll be fine, robots for those who are maybe more on the introversion side of the spectrum. And we did, and we tried it, and we found that actually users who had a robot that matched their personality did these boring exercises much longer, and they reported liking them more. So we took a lot of those lessons, and then we also worked with um, Alzheimer's patients, who are not expected to really recover, unfortunately, or improve on tasks. And yet, we were able to create these robots that would sing songs very badly. I will not play that video for you. You'll have to look it up on the web. Um, they would sing songs and encourage users to kind of guess the game and push the right buttons. And we were able to get Alzheimer's patients to improve. Um, this was a long six-month study, and they were actually able to improve. And most importantly, they really enjoyed in interacting with the robot. They enjoyed interacting with the robot. And that's important because they have less and less going on in their lives. Um, we also took robots and we put them in the homes of elderly people who were living alone and were feeling pretty lonely and tended to be quite sedentary. Now, that's not one of the elderly participants in our study. That's the PhD student who built the robot. Um, but as you can see, the robot is small and cute, and he would sit on its little pedestal and he would tell dad jokes, and he would also do a little dance. And um, people loved that. They would get up, they would dance with the robot, they would, you know, want to hear more jokes. It was extremely effective. We found that Basically, the people who had this robot in their home for two weeks would sit a lot less. But unfortunately, at the end, we had to take the robots back home, you know, to the lab, to their home. 
Um, and our users, unfortunately, went back to their sedentary ways because they missed their robot buddy. I mean, who wouldn't? And while we were working with users on the sort of other side of the age spectrum, we were also always very interested in infants and babies um, and young children, because if you can help them early, it really changes the course of their lives. And so it's never too early to start working with a robot to help you. Remember, I told you about rates of developmental disorders in uh, very young babies. So we were interested in getting babies who are not moving properly to exercise their body properly. But how do you get a baby to move in a particular way? Spoiler alert, you can't. You also can't get anyone to do anything you want, but that aside, how do you coach babies? Really hard, unless you can give them a robot that's their size, and they look at it, and they're maybe motivated to imitate. So let's watch that. So first, the baby's watching, and when the baby kicks, the robot kicks to reinforce the baby. Sometimes the robot kicks and the baby imitates. And after only about a couple of minutes, the baby learns. And they even like it. And what's important is they actually practice more, which helps them recover, and it helps them learn movement. So it's kind of like a really cute coach for an even cuter baby. And then we were inspired by that, so we developed robots for children with cerebral palsy who need to do exercises that are really, really boring. And we said, well, if you have to keep doing this, maybe the funnest way to do that is to do a number guessing game with the robot. And the robot guesses a number, and you say, no, higher, lower, higher, lower. So that was very effective. Um, we developed a robot that would help children at Children's Hospital Los Angeles who were about to receive IV injection treatments, which are quite painful, to cope with the upcoming pain and anxiety that they were feeling. So it's you know, really heartwarming doing this. And then, as I mentioned before, autism, which is so prevalent now, um, has been a real challenge for us, for the healthcare community, for the educational community. But interestingly, autism is a really great challenge for AI. Because the way AI works now is that it takes big data to train big models in order to exhibit you know, big general intelligence. Well, in autism, it's the other way around. You have tiny amounts of data, and the data are really messy and really inconsistent because each individual is different, and each individual changes over time, often in unexpected ways. And in fact, I think that's true for all people all the time. So autism is a really great challenge case for AI. So how do you develop systems that can adapt to each user, each child? And so we started out by developing robots that would just stimulate and engage children in doing play because often they don't know how to start playing. And then when you play, you have to do things like take turns and make eye contact, and that's really a, a lot of social skill learning. Mm -hmm. And that's an old robot, as you can tell. They get better looking. And then, we were also interested in the fact that imitation is a really important way to learn social skills, but often, um, children on the spectrum have issues with learning imitation, and so, and then learning by imitation. And so we created a robot that would help children be inspired and motivated to imitate, and would teach them to imitate. So let's look at what that looks like. Yes. Yes. Now move like this. Now move like this. So do you hear an echo? Basically, the robot tells the child what to do, yes. but the child yes. is imitating like this. the movement like and the this. voice. Because even knowing what to imitate, what not to imitate, is not obvious. So we learned a great deal from these studies over the years. And in the end, we got to a point where we could actually create a complete robot that we could leave in the homes of families with autism for a month to six weeks. And so we did this, um, and the robot was supposed to help children learn math skills. But when you're learning, you're not just learning any one thing. You're not just learning math, you're also learning social skills. That's a really important thing. In school, kids are learning social and cognitive and emotional regulation skills. And that's what this robot was trying to do. Meet Adrian, age six. This is some great work. And his robot friend, Kiwi. You are doing an amazing job. On this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games, along with big brother Darren. Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. Keep up the good work. So the thing that's interesting here is that Adrian has a screen. He could just be working from the screen, but then he won't learn any of the social skills and he won't have the motivation and the engagement. That's what the robot is for. 
And the children really loved the robots. They would, you know, wrap them in towels. That was a little scary for us from the engineering side. Never know what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, they, they named them, and they didn't want to let them go at the end of the study. And we keep having this experience. And this was especially sad, because this was two years before the COVID pandemic happened and before quarantine. And I just, oh, I so wish that millions of children and parents could have had robots like this to help them through what we all went through. So now, as I mentioned, anxiety and depression are at you know, epidemic levels. And so what we have developed lately is actually much smaller, cheaper, lighter, 3D printed robots as the one that you see. It has a crocheted skin. You can actually just make it out of cloth as well, the skin. You can decorate it, you can knit it, you can do whatever you'd like. And we have actually deployed these robots in the dorms at USC to help students deal with stress, to focus, um, to help them study, and even to help them do some breathing exercises and to do behavioral um, and to do um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And really encouragingly, we found that after two weeks of working with our robots, we found that the students had lower rates of psychiatric distress. And interestingly, we did a control experiment where we compared it to chatbots, and interacting with chatbots did not lower their psychiatric distress. So it's really important to have that embodied robot that is your buddy, like you, in this physical world. So now you've met some of our robots, and you can see that our goal has been always to create these machines that are for each person, and we're aiming to make them ever lower cost, ever more accessible, hopefully ever cuter, ever more engaging. These are really low cost. They're on the web. You can download the design. You can build your own. You can have your own coach buddy, whatever you'd like. You can run research studies. That's the idea, to really make this possible for as many people as possible. And to, that, to me, overall, is the vision of human-centered AI. So AI can be many things, and it will be many things. But one thing that I think it needs to be more of is human-centered. So the idea of these socially assistive robots, these robots that care, is that they're there to help each person pursue their purpose. And this is really different from most of AI, because if you think about what is most of AI about? Most of AI is about doing work so that people don't do that work. But if we don't have any work to do, then what is our purpose? Purpose is really important to what makes us human. So the idea with socially assistive robotics is actually to help you maintain that purpose. And to me, that's a great reason to be in AI. So that's why Mama makes robots. Um, that and the amazing people, especially students that I've gotten to work with and that join the privilege of seeing them do amazing things. So that's my story. That's why I'm in AI. That's why I'm in AI. Um, what about you? Why are you interested in AI?